When we order our lives, it not only helps maintain peace and sanity, but we are also able to optimize performance, improve efficiency, and make progress. In this simple motivational message from God's Word, we talk about four important areas we need to order in our world. All right. We're going to make our declaration now, so why don't we all stand up to our feet. Are we going to hold our Bibles high up in the air? We're going to say it loud, bold, and strong. Say it like you mean it. We're going to make our declaration together. Let's say this. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed. Victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn to the people next to you, in front of you, behind you. Shake hands. Give them a smile. Tell them you're happy to see them. And you may be seated, please. You know, one of the things we want to do as a church is that we want all of us to reach out to other people. Right? We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ must be shared, must be published, must be made known to people around us. And I want to encourage you as a person, this is not the sermon, just preparation. <laughs> I want to encourage you uh, as a believer in Jesus uh, to take bold steps to share the gospel. Talk to people. So one of the things that you and I need to do, one of the first steps is to start a conversation. Start talking to people. Right? And... Uh, there are so, several ways that you can start a conversation. One of the simplest things, whether you know it's a friend or a stranger, one of the simplest things to do is uh, to ask them, is there something I can pray for you? Right? Just ask them, is there something I could pray for you about? Right? Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit will give you something to pray for them. Uh, we'll talk about that you know, later on in the month of Feb. But I just want to share a couple of testimonies. You know, um, a couple of weeks back, we started going into Malaysia from that area, just serving the place, and we found coffee days, two coffee days near the place where we have a church, or where the church meets. And so I said, okay, these are two coffee days in a great place that we could start reaching out to people. So two of us, Manor and myself, we were there. So one, the first time we went, we sat on the coffee day, we ordered some samosa, and we saw one guy sitting by himself, you know, he's smoking cigarette, just busy on the phone, doing something. So we purposely went and sat next to him. Right? And the next thing, I leaned over and I said, hey, uh, is there something I can pray for you about? He's like, uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. And I said, okay, uh, you know, uh, we believe in Jesus. And so that's the reason now. Now you can start telling them, you know. When he says, I don't understand, you can start telling him. He said, I know, we believe in Jesus. And when we pray to Jesus, we believe he hears an answer. So sometimes people are going through problems. They may have sickness in their body. They may be going through problems in their life. So, you know, if there's something like that, would you like us to pray for you? Uh, he said, no, nothing. So, you know, it seems like the conversation is going to end, but I'm not giving up. So I said, hey, my name is Ashes. What's, by the way, what's your name? <laughs> so you got to, you know, push the conversation a little bit more. And then we started talking. Remember, this guy's a total stranger. He's probably in his early 30s, something like that. Total stranger. I started talking. I mean, he started, you know, where did you study? What do I do? We just started talking. Then in the process of conversation, see, he's not doing anything anyway. He's just sitting there. So <laughs> I said, hey, would you mind if I share with you the message of the Bible? Yeah, sure. You know. So I got his full attention. He's not going anywhere. He's right there sitting out there in coffee day. So shared the whole gospel with him, shared the whole message of Jesus Christ with him. He listened, really interested. Then prayed with him. I said, oh, would you like to pray? Would you like to receive, you know, forgiveness for your sins? Sure. No hesitancy. He's got to pray with him. And then, you know, basically he was he's a guy from Goa. He's running a bar there. And, uh, <laughs> and yet he's in Bangalore. He happens to be seated there. And, you know, shared the gospel, prayed the prayer with them. We exchanged numbers. I said, you know, I'm going to call you. Is it okay? It's perfectly fine. And now he was going to leave to go up first week of Jan. So I wanted to at least I'd meet to them one more time before he goes. 
So here's a here's the interesting thing that happened. Uh, I think it was last week. Uh, we wanted to go. I wanted to uh, meet with him before he left. Uh, and so I uh, messaged him. I said, "Hey, I'm coming at one o'clock to that same coffee day. Can you come?" So Manor and I we went to that coffee day. We were there at one o'clock. I just went to the restroom, came back, and this guy comes walking. He comes with his friend, and I said, "Hey, oh, so nice to meet you and everything." Uh, did you get my message? He said, what message? No. So he's like, he didn't get the message, but he's there at 1 o'clock. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. I said, God, this is, so, this is a, you know, God is telling us, don't give up. I care about this guy. Uh, he didn't get the message. Uh, he, but he showed up at 1 o'clock. And so we had a conversation with him. And that evening, he was leaving to Goa. Yeah. So God got me to reestablish. So then I called him again last week. Back in Goa, how are you doing? And then I, I just, you know, see, he's totally new to the Bible and everything. So just one little thought. You know, God has a plan for you. Share that with him and prayed with him on the phone. Right? So making this journey, winning another soul for Jesus. Amen? Now each one of us can do that. I'll tell you one more story. This, this guy again, this invest one day. You know, one Sunday we didn't have our projector, so we had to rent one. So one, you know, this, this called a company that from... Uh, that we rent. This guy came to do the project. He set it up for us. And, uh, you know, usually he'll set up and he'll go away and he'll come back to pick it up. But I said, hey, what's your name? Prem. I said, Prem, would you like to just stay? Attend the service. Sure. I stayed. And then that, that was all I did. I said, would you like to stay and attend the service? Now, he could have done his job and gone. But he stayed. Then I said, Prem, I'll take my number. I'll take your number. I'll be in touch with you. And uh, then I said, Prem, can you come back to church to bring all your friends? Today, four of them showed up. Four of them. Just simple thing. Can you stay for service? Four of them. Then I said, hey, guys, I'm going to meet you Saturday. I'm coming to coffee day. Thank God for coffee day. <laughs> Four o'clock. Bring all your friends. <laughs> and I will bring Bibles with me. And, uh, you know, I got to speak to all four of them this morning uh, in the morning service at West. And uh, I said, all of them agreed to come. Four o'clock, coffee day. Bring all your other friends. See, one person, now it's become four, uh, you know, three more. And I don't know how many will show up on Saturday. But you can see the impact you can have if you just step out. Amen? And you don't need a theology degree to do this. All you need is you love Jesus. You want to share the gospel. Amen? So I want to challenge you. Start doing it. Talk to people about Jesus. Start having a conversation. You know, uh, giving out tracts, I'm not against that. But you don't know what's going to happen after that. So try to have a conversation. You want to share Jesus with them. Uh, you want to talk to them about Christ because you care about their eternal destination. You care about their soul. And uh, wherever you are, you know, you, whether it's friends or strangers, start a conversation. Talk to them. Pray for them. And then, uh, you know, some may make a decision there. Some may, may make a journey. Whatever, but God is using you in some way uh, to lead souls to faith in Christ. Amen? All right, now we'll get to the message. All right. Uh, we're at the beginning of a year, 2018, so many of us are thinking, you know, what can we do? What can we do uh, this year? How can I do things better? And so a couple of these same messages in the early part of this year are geared towards that. So this morning, I want to talk bring a very simple motivational message, very simple thing, message. I want to talk to us about ordering our worlds, ordering our world. So it's nothing complicated, very simple message, share a few thoughts here uh, on ordering our world. I want to begin first of all from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, the Bible tells us here, whether, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whatever, right? That means everything, anything in life that you're doing, your day-to-day -day life, the routine, the mundane, the boring, the uninteresting, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of that means you do it to honor God. You do it 
to please God and you do it to reveal God. So when you say do it to the glory of God, he's like, what does it mean glory of God? You know, well, just do it to honor him, do it to please him and do it to reveal him. Let people see God in your life, even through the day-to-day -day things that you do. In whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So God's, God is interested in our everyday life and, you know, how we live life Monday through Saturday. Not just Sunday morning when we come and we worship God, say hallelujah, worship, praise, all that. I mean, God's interested in that, but he's also interested in the rest of our lives. Amen? And so one of the things that, that we can, we know, and it's not hard to deduce this, is that God is a God of order. I tell your neighbor, God's a God of order. <laughs> you know, when we look at creation, for instance, things are in order. The sun always rises in the east. The earth rotates on its axis the same way every day. It revolves around the same sun. You know, things are in order. Whether you look at the macro or the micro levels, things are in order. Amen? God's a God of order. And so it's, so let's just define, when we talk about order in our lives, what, what are we talking about? What, do, what are we referring to? Because the word order, of course, in English can be used uh, in many different ways. But let's talk about what are we referring to? The Oxford Dictionary, I'm just using that here. Uh, by order, we're talking about the arrangement or disposition of people or things in relation to each other. According to a particular sequence, pattern, or method. There is, there is some structure to this. Uh, a state in which everything is in its correct or appropriate place. Or some synonyms there, a sequence, arrangement, organization, structure, system. Now, most of us, for instance, have order in our closets. Example, the clothes, right? Most of us. So you have a certain place where you put your work clothes, the clothes you wear to work. You have another place where you put your you know, special clothes, that kind of clothes that you wear on special occasions for marriages and stuff like that. And then for those of you exercise, you have another place where you put the clothes you use for the gym. And then you have another place where you use cl put clothes for houseware. Does it make sense? Like I might <laughs> so most of us have some sort of order in the way we put our clothes. I mean, like, looks you're all looking at me like, hey. <laughs> like, I think most of us do that, right? We, we have certain places, you know, or a certain drawer where you have your socks and a certain place where you keep your handkerchiefs and all. And so now, uh, you know, when you want to get certain kinds of clothes, okay, you have to go for a wedding. You want to pick up, you know, pull out those special dresses that you wear for your wedding. You know where to put your hand, pull it out, you know, because you keep your clothes there. Uh, or those kinds of clothes in, in, in that certain place. So there is order, uh, most of us have order in the way we put our clothes, and it helps us, you know, to, uh, to get the clothes we need and so on. So what I want to just impress on our hearts is this, that, you know, God is a God of order. Therefore, it's safe to assume or safe to state that God calls us to order our lives and the things we do. God calls us. God wants that for us. He, uh, he expects us to imitate him. He is holy. He tells us to be holy. He is a God of order. So he requires us to follow that and be people of order, that there is order in our lives, in the way we do our life, uh, in the way we manage things that he has given to us in life. And we see that even in scripture. For instance, uh, just pick out some examples from the Bible. In the Old Testament, uh, when God told Moses how to build the tabernacle, he said, Moses, this is how you build it. It's got to have three, four, these three compart or these three sections, and uh, this is where you place all the different items that I've used in the tabernacle. And this is how you come to worship me, or the, the high priest would come to worship me. There's a certain order in this whole thing, and they had to follow that. It wasn't like the high priest did what he wanted. They had to follow what God instructed. Or think about this. When the 12 tribes were marching or making their journey from Egypt to uh, Canaan, 
It wasn't like, okay, guys, just chalo, let's go. Let's go. No. There was order. Each tribe had to go in sequence. First, Judah. Next, I, I forget they're all 12 tribes. But every tribe had its own place in the, in the order. And they marched in formation. They moved in order as they made their journey to the land of promise. There was order. I mean, why would God go into such detail to tell which tribe, which, which order? Because he's a God of order. He wants his people to proceed in a certain way, in a certain order. You all with me? Now, when you come into the New Testament, uh, again, we see examples of this. For instance, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians uh, in 1 Corinthians 14th chapter, and uh, he's talking about how they would come and worship God and you know, how they would meet together. Again, he's insisting, he's talking about order. And I'm just speaking two verses there, but you could read chapter 11 and chapter 14, where Paul is addressing this whole issue of order when they all come together. Uh, and in verse 33, he sa uh, verse 33, he says, God is not the author of confusion or chaos, but he's the order God of peace. He likes things peaceful. And then the very, uh, in verse 40, he says, let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. So even in how the church functions, how the body of Christ gathers together, how the body of Christ works with each other, God says, let it be decent, let it be in order. So it is safe for us to recognize this fact that God wants my life to be in order. He wants your life to be in order. I mean, there was an Old Testament king and he had this warning. I was wondering, should I quote this verse or not? Because the prophet came to him and said, set your house in order or else you'll die. <laughs> I was like, man, that's too hard, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's the word from the prophet. He came to the king and said, set your house in order or else you will die. <laughs> I mean, that is how stern that warning was. Not for us today, all right? <laughs> okay. So, anyway. So now... Order, when you talk about having order in our world, in, in the things that concern us, you know, in order, you know, affecting human behavior, 80% deals with, generally speaking, 80% deals with the why, 20% deals with the how. So if you and I can understand why I have to do this, that's 80% of the work, the motivation. If I'm convinced about the why, then the how is just the remaining 20% that we can all figure out. So we have to deal with the motivation of the human person. If you can get motivated, if you understand the why, if the why to do something grips you, then the how will follow. You got it? So why? Why should you and I have things in order. Why is order important for our lives? And, and I think we can sit down, we can uh, list a lot of things, number of things, but you know, let's just put uh, just four simple reasons why. Why is it important to order our world, our life, the things in our life? First, you know, it just helps maintain peace, sanity. Simple thing. If you had a specific place to keep your car key in your house, It will keep, maintain a lot of peace in your home. <laughs> if you left your car key wherever you desired when you walked in home, maybe one day is under the chair, another day it's in the refrigerator. <laughs> another day you leave your car key in you know, one of the bathrooms. Another day you leave your car key in your cupboard. I mean, if that was where you left your car key, if there was no set place, what happened? Every time you want to find car key, you want to find the car key, who whole house goes into tension. <laughs> Where's the car key? <laughs> and then it's 20 minutes to find the car key. But if you had a place, a set place where you kept the car key, it's so peaceful. Time to go? Sure. <laughs> Take the car key and you're out the door. That's why they have those key holders and all of that. Right? So just simple example that if there is order, it helps us all have, maintain peace and keep our sanity for the most part. Secondly, it helps optimize performance. You perform better because your energies are geared towards 
the main thing that you need to do and you're not expending your energy on, you know, all the, just trying to get things together, put it in order in the first place. It's already in order. Now go after the main thing. So expending, uh, uh, you're, you're optimizing performance when things are in order. You're able to go focus on the thing that needs to be done and not waste your resources on just trying to get, put things in order so that you can then do the work. It optimizes performance. Third thing is this. It helps improve efficiency. You are fast in your work. You know, and I'm not, I'm not talking about anyone here, but sometimes you see some people's desktop or their computer screen. Everything is on the desktop. <laughs> you know, I mean, all their files is on the desktop. And you're wondering, like, gosh, if they had to find a file, how are they going to find it in this big mess? <laughs> Everything is stuck on it. And how are you going to find something? So if you say, hey, can you find this file for me? They're like, yeah, just wait a minute. I'm searching, you know. <laughs> and it, it's like 10 minutes to find the file that's on somewhere on the desktop. And, you know, you come and ask me, what sermon did you preach on the fourth Sunday of April 2006? In two minutes, I'll tell you. Because all sermons I've preached, I mean, at APC, from 2004, that's 13 years, I have it filed by year, by month, and the file name is prefixed by you know, the year, month, and day. So you tell me, fourth Sunday of April, two minutes, open, this is it. Here's the sermon outline. I don't need more than two minutes to pull it out for you. I can tell you. So... If you, but how did it happen? It's all in order. It's all in order. So I can pull it out. And for that matter, er, different areas of ministry. You tell me what's happening in the youth ministry. What is the plan for 2018 youth ministry? Two minutes. I can bring up the, our planning document for youth ministry. I'll pull it up. I know where it is. It's all structured. It's all in order. As long as my laptop doesn't crash. <laughs> but it's all in order. And efficiency. It can save time. Save time. Instead of, oh, what did I preach? Where can I find it? You know, improves your efficiency. So that your time is now invested in what really matters, not time spent searching and doing unnecessary tasks, which could have been saved if you just had order. In, in what you did. So improves efficiency. And number four, it helps make progress. So if you want to make progress, if you are actually ordering things in your life and have things in order, you can measure, am I making progress or not? Am I taking steps to make progress? Because if you don't have things in order and you're not uh, ordering your resources, your time towards something, you're not going to make progress. You just be in the same place. You may be busy, but not necessarily making progress. So order is also important for that. So very quickly, how do we order our world? So when you say, you know, how do you order world? What are two important things that you and I need? One is we need structure, and second, we need controls. So if you want to order your world, if we want to order our world, we need structure. For example, if you want to order your time, you need some structure. Most of us have a, a calendar, a, a, a planner, uh, many of us use digital planners. All of that is fine. But you need some structure, something where you put in how I'm going to use my time. And then you need controls. Controls has to do with what would be priority, values, limits, choices. So if there are five people who want to meet you, how are you going to decide which five? Who And when are you going to meet this five? Who is more important? Uh, whom you need to meet today? Whom you need to meet tomorrow? And those kinds of things. So that, that comes out of controls. What controls do you have? You have priorities. So you need structure. You need priority. You need controls. So about your car key. About the car key. We need structure. We need a place to keep the car key whether it's a key holder, a basket, something. That's your structure. But you also need control, which is the discipline that every time I walk in, that's where I'm going to put the car key. Otherwise, you can have key holders hanging all over the walls, <laughs> but no control. <laughs> the key is still missing. There is no control. So you've got to have structure. You've got to have controls, right? So 
these two things are essential if there is going to be order in our world. So this morning, I want us to take some time in the Word of God to address four areas. And there are many areas we could talk about. But I want to address four areas where we need order. And I just want to bring certain scriptures in relating, relating to these four areas just to motivate us to work on establishing order, putting some structure and controls in place for these four areas. Now, I don't want to be prescriptive this morning. That means I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. That's not the point. I just want to share, share some insights from the Word of God on these four areas, and then you decide what you need to do in your life to bring order or to make things better. Most of us may already have things in order in our lives, but look at improvements. Look at areas that you can improve. Maybe draw some insights from Scripture and apply them uh, uh, to your life. So let's talk about these four areas. Time, relationships, finances, and growth. Four areas. Important areas. Number one, time. So for most of us, our time is consumed by our commitments and people. So we all have commitments. Work, committed to... Serving in church, committed to doing other things. So we have commitments. Because you're, 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 you've taken up responsibilities. So we have commitments. And then we also have people who want our time. They want to meet us. Maybe they want to play soccer with us. Maybe they want to do worship with us. Maybe they want to have lunch with us, people around us. And our time for most of us goes in these two areas. In, towards our commitments, towards people. Now... Here are a few insights from Scripture as far as time is concerned. This is not exhaustive. I've just picked a few verses uh, from the Word of God concerning time. Just to uh, place them before us this morning. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, God says this. See then that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly simply means to walk carefully, to walk with thought. Uh, the, the, the Greek there literally means to walk exactly, precisely, accurately. That means to giving thought to the way you're living, you're living your life. See then that you live carefully. Not as fools, but as wise. How do you know you're walking circumspectly, carefully? Redeeming the time. Buying back your time. Redeem simply means to buy back. So there are things that are trying to take away your time, but you're buying it back. It comes at a price. The price could be discipline. The price could be sticking to your schedule. The price could be saying no to things that are unnecessary. Whatever it is, you're buying back your time, redeeming your time. So do you need to buy back your time? That means it comes at a price. It's not easy. Other things are pulling away on your time, but you pay a price. I'm not going to, I say no to those things. I'm buying it back. I'm redeeming my time. So if you look at the way, You've been spending your week, your month, and you say, you know, what are areas I can buy back my time? But I need to pay a price. And I say no to something so that I can use that time for other things. Example, a price to pay is maybe uh, an hour less of sleep. But you still get a good sleep. Or maybe saying no to two hours of television every day. Some of us, right? Bring it down to maybe just 30 minutes, whatever. But that's buying back your time. You're redeeming your time. There's a price. You're giving up something in order to get that time back and use it more profitably. So redeem your time because the days are evil. And another control that we have here for time is in verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Is another control is the will of God. What is what is God's will for you? Where is God? What does God want you to be doing in this time in this time of your life? The will of God, and then you buy back your time in relation to that. So if God wants you in this phase of your life to be spending time with your children, say no. I think I've shared these examples with you. There was a time when you know, Josh and Ruth, our kids were y- younger. Uh, and Saturday mornings, and this was like for two years, three years, I forget exactly. Saturday mornings was booked. It was daddy and children. 
Nobody could take that time. I bought it already. I paid in advance. Every Saturday morning, we would go early morning Sundays. We play soccer. Then we'd take. Uh, we'd go. Uh, they were going to music schools. We'd take them off to music. Josh was there. Music school. On the way, we'd sit in sanctuary, have some. No, this is Indrani is here this morning. <laughs> Uh, we'd go to sanctuary, have some breakfast there. I still remember those nice omelets, you know, <laughs> sanctuary special. But that was my time with kids. Nobody can have that time. I remember somebody called me and said, can you come and preach for us on Saturday morning? I said, uh, uh, you know, the times I'm meeting here. I said, sorry, I can't come. Why? I'm going to spend time with kids, my kids. Sorry, I can't come and preach. Why? That's... Family time. That was a season of life where I, that was, I'm committed to that. I bought it already back, bought it in advance. Nobody can buy it from me now in advance. Because that, that season of life, you'll never get again. Josh has gone to college now. Uh, that, that's gone. That time is gone. But at that stage, I had to do that. I did that. Are you understanding? So you've got to understand what is the will of the Lord. What is God's will at this season of your life? And don't be afraid to say no to other people. He said, what a worldly pastor he is. He's spending time with his family. <laughs> hey, that's God's will for my life in that season. <laughs> I can always preach many sermons later. <laughs> but in that season, I had to do that. I had to be there for the children. Amen? Preaching can come anytime. You can preach a lot later. So, that's it. Know what the will of the Lord is in that season of life. Buy your time back. Another scripture in Ephesians 3, Ecclesiastes 3, 1. To everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. To everything there is a season. So think about this. How can you apply it as far as you handling your time? You know, if a 10th standard kid came to his dad and said, Dad, I want to get married. I mean, marriage is good. Out of season, boy. <laughs> Not the season. <laughs> this is the wrong season. To everything there is a season. Wait for your season. It'll come. Now, study. Pass your 10th. <laughs> Finish your 12th. Now, study. Everything there is a season. So, how can you apply it in your life? Maybe there are some things that, uh, that you want to do desperately, but now is not the season. Wait for the season. It'll come. Focus on what is appropriate, what is right for the now season of your life. And you wait for that activity or that work or that thing that you want to do for the appropriate season of your life. So that's how you manage time. Think about Ecclesiastes 8 verses 5 and 6. I'll read first from the New King James and then from the uh, Contemporary English Version. It says, he who keeps his, the king's command, will experience nothing harmful. And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment, because for every matter there is a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. Oh, let's read from the contemporary English version. It puts it nicely here. If you obey the king, or for modern terms, it'll be if you obey your boss, you will stay out of trouble. So be smart and learn what to do and when to Simple. At work, you want to please your boss, you want to make your boss happy, learn what to do and when to do it. It's the Bible saying that. Learn what to do and when to do it. And then the next verse says, life is hard. So get depressed? No. Life is hard, but there is a time and a place for See, life is hard, but here's a way in which you can enjoy life. If you understand that there is a time and a place for life is hard for all of us. There are challenges, there are ups and downs, and all kinds of things happen. But if you and I learn that there's a time and there's a place for everything, you can still enjoy life. You can still uh, do well. Are you with me? So think about what can you do that, even though life is hard for you, for all of us, there are challenges, there are pressures. How can you make better use of your time 
knowing that there is a time, there is a place for everything that you have to do. How can you optimize your time? How can you put order to your time so that you can still enjoy the journey? Even though, yeah, life is hard. There are challenges around us. How can you still enjoy it? One last one here as far as time is concerned. First Chronicles 12.32. It talk, talks about a particular tribe uh, among Israel, the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Can you imagine this? These people knew what an entire nation is supposed to be doing. They were so in tune with the times. They understood the times so that they knew the course of direction for an entire nation. God can do that same thing for you and me. That he can give us understanding of times, not only for our personal lives, but for your household, for your family, uh, for people under your influence, uh, for people that you might be leading in your workplace, for your organization, for a business unit that you're heading up, whatever. If they can do it for an entire nation, they could do it for an entire nation. God can help you to understand what you, what, whatever you're responsible for, that you understand the time so that you can guide, know what they have to do. So are you with me so far? So to manage time, to order time, put structure, put some controls in place. I encourage you to do that so that you can glorify God with your time. Number two, with relationships. Relationships are important. People influence us. The right kind of people sharpen us. The wrong kind of people just weaken us. And there are a number of scriptures on this. I want to just share a few with you and then talk about it. Proverbs 27, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, a man sharpens his friend. So people can actually make you better. But the right kind of people. So you and I want to get better. We want to get sharper. Hang out with the right kind of people. You want to get better in a certain skill. If you want to get good in keyboard, hang out next to Jonathan. If you want to get good in guitar, hang out with Roshan. Right? You hang out with the right kind of people who can sharpen your skill. You can learn from them. See how they do it. And they'll sharpen you. And sharpen your skill. So, as iron sharpens iron, you can be sharpened just to the influence by being around the right kind of people. But even the wrong kind of people can hurt you. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. So, you hang out with somebody who's angry. Sooner or later, his approach to problems will rub off on you. You'll start responding and reacting to situations like that person. Instead of, you know, maybe you or somebody was really calm and quiet, but then you hang up with this person who's always responding like a volcano, erupting at every instant. You'll, you'll start doing the same thing. And only be detrimental. Or like it says in First Corinthians 15, 33, evil company corrupts good habits. You may have good habits, but if you stay... In the wrong company, even the good habits you have will get corrupted, will get degraded. So your friendships matter. So whom are you spending time with? Are you spending time with people who will enrich you? So we all need people who encourage us, who challenge us, who inspire us, and yeah, have fun with them. But they're going to pull you up. They are lifting you up. Are you surrounding yourself with those kinds of people? And I'm not saying you have a need a crowd, but even if you have two people like that, that's enough. And then we must be careful of people who drain us, weaken us, discourage us. Now, sometimes you can't avoid these people. For instance, if they are your classmates, you can't say, I'm going to change classroom. <laughs> you have to sit with them. If they are people at work, you have no choice. You have to be with them. But you can... Do some things to protect yourself from being influenced by them. 
from having your good habits become being degraded. Keep a healthy distance or put some defenses up that protect you from their influence if they are the wrong kind of influence in your life. You're very aware. You've got to be watchful. Don't just fall for it. Protect yourself. We also need people whom we serve. That means we not only receive, but we want to give. So find some people that you can serve. Now, we can't serve the whole world, but you can serve some of the people in the world. So find the people that you can serve. How can you invest in their lives? How can you bless them? How can you encourage them? So people are important. Put some structure and some controls in place. And there are some people who call and say, not from here. From somewhere in the city or wherever else. They come and we want to meet you, Pastor. So my question is, what is it about? Because time is important. But also whom I spend that time is also important. So what is it about? I want to know. What, what, what do you want to meet me for? What is it about? And then they might say something. And I say, okay, you know, uh, somebody else can handle that. Because they, especially if it's all these promotional meetings. I don't need to. I can use that to meet people with needs or with, with, with uh, people that I can help and so on. So you've got to make this choice of the people who are going to take your time. Are they going to help you? Are you going to be able to help them? Things like that. Be, have structure. Have some controls. You understand the values uh, and who you're going to uh, spend time with in whatever you do. Number three, and I'll move to the next two uh, quickly. Uh, did you all get off the train? Are you still on it? Okay. Number three, finances. How about our finances? Uh, do we have some order in the way we use our finances? You know, this, uh, every year and this year also, we'll have the financial planning workshop happening twice a year. And if you need help, attend that workshop to just learn, just to get some you know, understanding on how do I order my finances so that it's, it's, it's used well. And unfortunately, you know, uh, young people, you get your job, you're still at home, so you're not paying rent. Uh, you're not paying any money for food. Your mom is still cooking for you. But you got a job. You're earning maybe 25000 maybe, I don't know, what, whatever you start with. I said, like, wow, I got all this money. And I have no responsibility. That's danger. Because you got this money and no responsibility. Somebody needs to teach you how to use that money. Otherwise, over a weekend, you get paid on 30th or 31st. Before a second comes, money is gone. <laughs> Where did it go? Morning I was in Central. Then I was in Forum. <laughs> then I was, you know, wherever. You visit all the malls over the weekend, money is gone. No order to your finances. And it's a dangerous habit because, you know, if that's the way you do mo handle money before you get married, God bless your spouse. <laughs> they are in for a rude awakening. <laughs> so after you get married, you want to do the same thing. Hey, but now you've got responsibility. There's rent to pay. Groceries to be bought. Car payments to be made, whatever. So many other things. You can't do that weekend in more forum anymore. <laughs> Forget it. You've got to bring some order to your finances. I want to just refer to one passage. I mean, that you know, the Bible talks a lot about money. There was one passage here in Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 10 to 12. This was after Jesus gave a, a, a story of a steward. A man was put in charge of somebody else's business. Uh, he didn't take care of it well, and then he had to do some things to, you know, just make up for it. And then in conclusion, Jesus makes these three statements. I want to just look at that. Luke 16, verses 10 to 12. He says, he who is, and remember the context is money. The context is running a business. So let's look at these verses in that context. Verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in 
If you take care of your 10,000 rupees salary, you will also be able to take care of 1 lakh. Is that right? He is faithful in what is least, is also faithful in what is much. Handling money. Second, he says in verse 11, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Now think about it. Jesus is relating money to true riches, eternal riches. And many of us don't think that's important. Ah, God doesn't care how I handle my money. He cares. Verse 11 says, if you, put it, putting it in a positive, if you are faithful in the way you handle your money, God will also entrust you with taking care of eternal things for his kingdom. That's what he's saying. Unrighteous mammon, money. True riches, eternal riches, things of his kingdom. You take care of your money, he will entrust you to take care of things of his kingdom, is what Jesus is saying. The last one. If whoever is faithful in another man's, if, if, you, if you're not being faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? That means be faithful when you're using somebody else's thing. Now, if you are employed, if you're working for someone, it's a simple example. Oh, there's a copy, there's a photocopy machine in the office. All right. I need to Xerox, you know. I need to Xerox, I just, that's for fun. I'm, I need to Xerox my comic book. All right. Shalom, use it. <laughs> or I need to Xerox this or that. It has nothing to do with work, just use it. You're not being thoughtful of what is somebody else's. That is in the office for office. But if you handle it carefully, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying be scared, thing, but just be dutiful. Hey, this belongs to the office. It's for office purpose. I'm being faithful in what is another man's. It belongs to the company. It belongs to the organization. I just need to use it faithfully. Use it for its intended purpose. What Jesus is saying is, if you're faithful in what is another man's, you will be given your, and that doesn't mean, doesn't mean you'll get a photocopy mission at home. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is, God can entrust you with things that you can be in control. That you can have as your own. Maybe somebody run, someday run your own business, or uh, have your own organization, or head up your own business unit, or have your own, head up a, a department, or whatever. Something that God can entrust you, and know that you will do it right. Because you've been faithful earlier in taking care of what is somebody else's. Are you with me? This is one of those Sundays you wish you didn't come to church, right? <laughs> At least I can say I didn't hear that message. No. So, how do you handle money? Little things. Handle money to show that you can also be a good steward of kingdom things. Handle what belongs to somebody else. You handle it carefully with with a sense of regard and duty and responsibility so that God can trust you with what is your own. Last one, we close with this, no, growth. God is interested in our growth. God wants us to grow spiritually, personally, professionally. Keep growing. Don't stop growing. Don't stagnate. So you've got to have things in order have structure, have some controls in place so that you can keep growing. If you don't have that, you will not grow. And you need to do things to grow. For example, maybe read books, uh, maybe take courses, maybe acquire new skills. I mean, whatever it means in your life for you to grow, do it. Now, never stop learning. Never think... Education has ended. You, know, you may have graduated. We all graduated from school and college. And yeah, but that doesn't mean you, can you need to stop learning or stop educating yourself. You can still do it, but you need to have structure and controls in place. For your own spiritual life, Second Peter 3, uh, verse 7 and 18, Peter writes, he says, Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away by the wicked. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. Don't, don't let the wicked lead you away from your, the firm faith you have. What's the antidote to being led astray? Keep growing. Keep growing in grace, your character. Keep growing in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep growing. What are you going to do? Of course, be a part of a good church. You spend time in fellowship with people. But in your personal life, do you spend time with God? Do you read the Bible? Are you reading good Christian books? Are you listening to sermons? Things that you can do to grow. Are you with me? You can put some structure, put some controls in place. Some simple things like I do is I put sermons on my phone. And when I'm driving, I listen to sermons. I have, I use my iPad mini. I have, I don't know, like several books on it. So if I'm not driving and I get to sit in the car or if I'm waiting somewhere, I'm reading. So in this iPad, I think there are over 100 books, Christian books. Uh, it's not for sale, but <laughs> <laughs> the point is I don't have to carry all the books with me. I just carry the iPad. And there are, I think, more than 100 books on it, Christian books. I, I can read. I can mark on it and read. When I get a chance, open, read. So there's a structure. I have a place where the books are. There are controls. Free time I get, I'm reading. Or I have a phone that's got sermons on it. Free time I, when, I, when I have the time, I can listen. Or when I go to the gym, on the treadmill, I'm listening to sermons. So I'm listening to the word of God at every opportunity I get. You put some structure and controls in place. You can do that. You're growing. You're growing spiritually. Are you with me? Same thing for your personal life. You know, nowadays we have so many courses for free from some of the best universities available for us online. You go to edX, you go to Udacity, you go to Coursera, you go to uh, Udemy. I mean, you've got so many of these online courses. And they're free courses. And they're from the best universities in the world. And all you've got to do is to have some structure and control. That is, I'll take some time every evening or, you know, uh, through these three days of the week and I'm going to spend so many hours to do this particular course. You can keep educating yourself. Are you with me? And you can learn in your area of interest. I mean, uh, if you're a software programmer, you can keep learning. Just keep developing skills. You don't have to wait for your organization to send you for training. You can learn it for free online. Keep developing skills in your area. All it needs is some structure and some controls in place. So if you've decided that when is the evenings? You're going to keep two hours to do it. If your friend calls you for a movie, you have a choice. You can say, yes, I come or no. Maybe some days you can, you know, okay, fine. But the norm would be, sorry, I've got a control. I've got controls. I've got to do that two hours to do that course. But that is up to you. If you have order, you can keep growing. If you don't have that order, if you don't have that structure and control in place, your growth is left to chance. And most likely, you're not going to grow. Or maybe it'll be very slow. Are you with me? Okay. He's finished scolding you. Stand up. <laughs> All right. Let's rise to our feet. I call our worship team up. So I want to close once again with this verse, same verse. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do. Let God be glorified in your life. And uh, do it to honor him, please him, reveal him, magnify him to people. One of the ways we can do it is when we put order in our lives. Order your time. Order your relationships. Order your finances. Order your growth. So that you could be all, all of us can glorify God in our lives. So as you look forward to 2018, how are you going to spend this year? One good thing to do is to put some order. So take some time this week. Think about what structure you can put in place for your time, for your relationships, for your money, for your growth. What structure can you put in place? And what controls? You need controls to follow that. 
So that as you progress to 2018, there's order in your life and you'll gain the benefits of that. I want to take a few moments to pray before we close this morning, please. And... Uh, I just want to pray, and I just feel this thing coming back to me over and over again from, from the time we were worshiping. And I don't know this personally for myself, but there's probably someone here that you've just relocated to Bangalore. The scenario that I'm getting is this, that you've just moved back to Bangalore. You probably moved to Bangalore from maybe the Middle East. That's the sense I'm getting. But you've come here, and the reason for you just moving back here it's because you're really, you're, you're right, right now going through what we would call as a desert experience in your life. And you're back here. And, and, and that's the situation you're in. But you just moved back recently. Maybe this week, last week, whatever. It's, you just moved back here and this is what you're going through. I just want to pray God's blessing over you. I just want to assure you this morning that God is able to cause your life to blossom. God is able to cause your life. He's able, he's able to beautify your life. He's able to make your life beautiful. So if you're here this morning and you relate to what I'm saying, and it means something to you, then I want you to receive it. And I'm, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. I don't want to embarrass you or put you in any awkward situation but if it is you I just want you to receive it and if you want to you can always send an email let us know but the word I want to just release for you is that God will beautify your life that God will cause your life to prosper God will cause you to blossom he will do it he will take care of you This morning, just receive that. Father, we just want to pray for the presence and the ministry of your Holy Spirit upon our lives. To give us the wisdom we need, God. To be able to order our lives. To put structure and control in place so that our lives will glorify your name. That we'll be better, God, in handling what you've given to us. The time, the relationships, the money, and the opportunities for growth. That we'll better use that so that our lives will glorify you. Holy Spirit, we just ask you for wisdom. We ask you for wisdom for each of us. God, you will speak to us so strategically that even small changes will produce big results in our lives. For some of us, that's all we need to do. Make a small change and you will see great outcomes, great results. So as you're standing here just praying, let the Holy Spirit give you some ideas. Just a small change in the way you handle time or your money or your relationships or your growth. And you'll see great results. Make a note of things that come into your mind, your heart right now. Go do it. Go do it. You will see great results. We thank you, Lord. Before we close this morning, I just want to give an invitation for anyone who's never 
receive Jesus Christ into your life. The Bible tells us so clearly that Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. He was buried, he rose up again, and he's alive today. And anyone who believes in him, the Bible says their sins are forgiven, they're made new creatures in Christ, and they become children of God. So if you're somebody, you've never believed in Jesus, you've never received Jesus into your life, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer so that you can receive Christ into your life. And he can make you a brand new person. He can change things. He can set you free. He can give meaning and purpose and direction for your life. So I want to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you've never prayed like that before, just follow with me in this prayer this morning. Just say this with me, please. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me follow you the rest of my life. Give me a new start. A new beginning. A new life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. I'd just like to see your hand if you don't mind. We want to just celebrate with you. We also want to give you a bag of resources that you can take with you. So if you pray this prayer with me for the very first time, could you please raise your hand? Anyone here with us? Pray this prayer with me for the very first time. Anyone down here? Anyone up in the balcony? Okay. I don't see any hands. But if you did, on your way out at the exits, there'll be our, 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 our greeters will be there. They'll be holding this green bag with them. Just tell them, you know, I prayed that prayer this morning. And uh, can I have that back? And there's a card, a decision card. You just write your name and number and they'll give it back to you. And we will be in touch with you to help you uh, how to use the resources that are in that bag. Let's close and we'll dismiss. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Set your world in. God bless you. Enjoy your week. See you again. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at abcwo.org. Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.